Chapter 15. Living the street life comes with consequences. For me, those consequences came with a severe sentence and my placement in a prison where my life could be taken at any moment. Feeling the need to be alone with my thoughts, I opt for the yard this morning. Mornings are the one time where there is peace here at Big Sandy, as most of the convicts are required to be at their jobs. Being new, no job assignment has been made for me, and with a 40-year prison term, a job is the last thing I want. Guys in here work eight-hour days, five days a week, for about $20 a month, on average. For some convicts, jobs pass the day. I would rather pass my day playing handball or walking the track. My hope is that today will be better than yesterday. Some of my uneasy tension has become a bit suppressed with the realization that this is my life. Every morsel of Big Sandy is a part of my life now. From the violence to the razor wire, it is all part of me. I earned it according to my sentencing judge. Forty years in Big Sandy was sufficient for my nonviolent drug conviction. Some days I feel like I don't give a fuck about anything. It is usually the days when I replay my sentencing day. The day when my mother disappeared and left me wondering if I would ever see her again. Reality is, I have to be here. Making the best of it is the only option. There are more people on the yard today than usual. My peaceful walk alone with my thoughts fade quickly as I easily recognize that there is tension on the yard. The tension is so thick you can cut through it with a knife. Already my prison instincts are coming to fruition. One of the most important tools I have learned within the first few days of being here is that I must be observant. Being able to recognize everything going on around me is one key to surviving in this hellhole. Scanning the yard like a hawk soaring over an open field looking for prey, I notice Mexican prisoners forming small groups around the yard. This world I now live in is a dog-eat-dog -dog world filled with lions and hyenas with very few zebras. Deep discussions are being had between the shot caller for the Serenios and some of his soldiers. My secret hope is that whatever problem is afoot has nothing to do with the whites and Mexicans. There are about 20 white convicts on the yard, including me, compared to at least 75 Mexicans. We would get slaughtered. Thinking back to what Adam told me about the Serenios, I know every one of them is likely armed with a shank. This thought convinces me that as much as I might not want a knife, it may very well be time to get one and keep it on me at all times. Being here in Big Sandy, I know now that I would rather get caught with it than not with it. As the thought filters through my subconscious, I find out the problem with the Serenios has nothing to do with the whites when a large Mexican soldier grabs one of his comrades from behind in a chokehold. The victim is another Sereno named Noki, who also lives in the same unit I am housed in. More Serenios circle Noki. They deliver punches to his head, face, and body. Before long, he is rendered unconscious. The large Mexican lets Noki's limp body fall aimlessly to the ground. Other people join the fray, dishing out powerful kicks to Noki's head and body. One of the kicks wakes Noki from his comatose state. Using the nearby fence, his fingers lock onto the shiny metal fence as he pulls his body up. Finding his feet, he stumbles on a large push broom. Fighting for his life, he begins to swing the broom like Barry Bonds on steroids, chasing the home run record. Come on, puto! Noki screams like a wild animal as the warm blood runs down his face. One of the soldiers rushes in, swinging wildly. Noki's swing connects perfectly with the side of the combatant's head. Watching the first guy fall sends Noki into a raging fury. He backs up to the fence yelling profanities in Spanish. His swinging intensifies in barbaric nature. Four men rush at him at the same time. The broom connects with the side of one of the attackers. This slows Noki down. The others pounce on him like mountain lions on a fawn. The alarm finally goes off, ordering everyone to the ground. Most of the prisoners comply, but not the combatants. Once again, Noki is on the ground. The broom is now being used on him. Both Spanish and English are blaring out of the speaker, ordering all the prisoners to the ground when the first gunshot rings out, warning the soldiers that live rounds will be coming if the brutal assault does not cease. Bang! Bang! I feel an explosion. Officers circle the Serenios. Small black balls sail through the air, hitting everyone in the vicinity. One man screams. I look up, shielding my eyes. I think he is shot. But no. Concussion grenades are being deployed to break up the melee. Another one explodes and I cover my head with my arms. Warning shots ring out again from the guard towers. Officers enter the gladiator pit, tackling the men to the ground with no remorse. I envision some old clips of the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers defense, 
One man is picked up and body slammed. Another grenade comes flying down from the guard tower. It explodes in the air, sending little black balls everywhere. They are ricocheting off the ground, off the handball walls, flying everywhere with no intended target. Whoever gets hit, gets hit. The balls do not discriminate. The guard towers stand over 30 feet high. Sharpshooters are stationed in each of the seven towers. I cover my head with my arms. I'm face down on the ground. My only hope is that I'm not hit by a live round if those start flying. With staff in the area, I'm probably safe, though. Usually when correctional officers are in the area, the cops in the gun towers refrain from letting real bullets fly. I am thankful that staff has arrived, and that with their arrival, my chances of being accidentally shot have diminished. Had staff not arrived when they did, there was no doubt in my mind that someone would have been shot. These combatants had an order from the shot caller to complete a mission, assaulting Noki until he died or until the cops arrived to stop them. The attackers had no intention of stopping. Even the gunshots did not deter them. The threat of possible death meant nothing. In the real world, the thought of getting shot or killed would be a deterrent. In here, the real world has long been forgotten by these men. When you are in a place like this with a sentence of forever, death becomes a welcoming thought. Once everything is lost, there is nothing left to live for. There is no fear of death. A man with a life sentence has been through so many ups and downs on that long criminal justice roller coaster that no emotions remain. With sentences ranging from 30 years to life, there is nothing left that can be done to hurt the man who has been stripped of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That man sees death the same way a Muslim martyr does. The hope is that there will be something better on the other side of the rainbow, because this side has nothing but suffering, pain, and loneliness. Fuck rainbows. I don't like them no more. Many people like me are serving draconian sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. What is mind-boggling to me is that while these 40-year sentences for nonviolent drug crimes are being handed out, the average sentence in federal court for murder is 22 years. Had I killed someone, I would likely have been sentenced to 18 less years. The federal criminal justice system no longer has a parole system. When that door slams behind every prisoner with a crucial sentence, there are only two ways out of here, winning relief in court or a body bag. Sadly, most people will leave here in a body bag. With my sentence, if I behave, I will get about five years off my term. Instead of getting out at 64 years old, I can get out at 59 years old. That truth disturbs me. With no incentive to do the right thing, many of the men around me become vultures, living a barbaric life riddled with anger and violence on an astronomical level. Behaving yourself in prison is almost impossible because other prisoners' actions dictate your reactions. Those reactions might require a person to stab the other person. Sometimes those reactions don't leave a person any choice. The prison machine is designed in such a way that it applies oppression. It's designed so the prisoner never wins. It's designed so the prisoner always loses. Like with Noki, he was fighting for his life. Had he simply not fought back, he would certainly have died. Once he fought back, he earned a write-up for fighting. There is no such thing as self-defense in prison. Once a prisoner starts swinging, he loses 27 good conduct days on average. When Noki gets back from the hospital, he will be taken in front of a disciplinary hearing officer. That's his reward for fighting for his life. He will now have to spend 27 more days in prison where any one of those days could be his last. His gang will no longer want him after the brawl. Noki is a marked man. A man marked by one of the most vicious prison gangs in the system, the Serenios. Noki's provocation was a common one. He owed the Crips for heroin. Owing money to the blacks is not allowed by the big homie, the man who calls the shots for the gang. Noki has two yard violations. He was dealing with the blacks, and he couldn't pay his debt. In order to avoid a physical conflict with the Crips, the beating was on full public display. Hands laid, debt paid, is a common theme in here. The debt was paid with Noki's blood, kind of like Christ paying the debt of sin on the cross. In Big Sandy, the sinners keep sinning. Noki, like many before him, and many who will come after him, allowed his heroin addiction to get out of control. His tab kept riding higher with his need to get high. Knowing he could not pay never dissuaded him. The thought of getting hurt or killed did not override his hunger to let the fish swim through his veins. The heroin told him, follow me, everything is all right, kind of like that Uncle Cracker song, follow me. When the Crips had enough of the false promises of payment being made, they went to Noki's shot caller 
They knew that the only payment they would see would be blood, and they likely enjoyed that prospect. When assaults like the one on Noki happen, it is akin to the spectators at the old Roman gladiator pits, cheering for the victim to be finished. Most of the men here enjoy seeing a good, violent scuffle. Although they secretly pray, they are never on the receiving end. Had the Crips taken it upon themselves to assault Noki, the whole yard would have erupted like a festering volcano. It would have created a full-fledged war between the Hispanics and the Blacks. Such a war would have reached every other maximum security prison in the federal system that houses Serenios and Crips. The easiest way to settle the dispute was to punish Noki by vicious means. His death or his transfer to another facility after his physical discipline even the score. Dealing with the blacks, owing a debt to them ensured he was ostracized from his gang. For the rest of his time in prison, he is a marked man. Another unwritten rule in here is that you never stop beating or stabbing another prisoner until either staff intervenes or you kill the person. This is how every car, group, or gang operates. One thing that I am intrigued by is why Noki's gang brothers allowed him to get so far in debt, knowing the end result was going to be an attack like this. My guess is the people who knew were getting high with him. The others had no money to pay for the heroin, but Noki had both the balls to deal with the blacks and enough swagger to convince the Crips that he had money, at least initially. The cycle of prison life is vicious, like a pack of hungry wolves in Yellowstone National Park, searching for vulnerable prey. Two hours of laying on the hard concrete causes pain to creep into the muscles of my legs. Some of the men are laying on their backs enjoying the warm summer sun. Others are talking amongst themselves. I too have changed my position to ease my discomfort. On my back now, I stare into the deep blue sky, tricking myself into believing that I can see Jesus Christ's face in the clouds. For a second, I whisper a plea for freedom to him. I blink my eyes a few times, and he's still there in the clouds. It's almost as if he is smirking at my request. I snicker at the absurdity of it, that I think I see him. Or maybe my snicker is because of the absurdity of him granting me freedom from here. Hell, he could have intervened a long time ago and put it on one of the jurors' hearts to vote to acquit me. He could have put it in all their hearts. Instead, he decided to send me to Big Sandy with a 40-year sentence so he could sit in the clouds laughing at me. Whether he is really there in the clouds or not, I throw a middle finger to the laughing cloud. Fuck you, I mouth silently. This ain't funny. Before I can say anything more, officers are ushering us up to our feet. Brushing the dirt off the front of my pants, I scan the yard. The other men are grateful that they can finally stretch their legs out. As we head back to the housing units, I look back one last time before I walk through the doorway. He is there, in the clouds again, laughing at me. Chapter 16 Come on, Chad, I need your help with something, my neighbor Red says. What do you need my help with, I ask. Just come on, I'll show you. I walk into Red's cell. It's extremely hot. Wires are dangling off the wall. There's a mop bucket on the floor with a plastic bag inside it. Another mop bucket has a bag filled with homemade wine. Red has had this concoction brewing for three or four days. Everyone has a hustle. Red is turning wine into moonshine. This is how he pays for his heroin addiction. Red is from North Carolina. A few years back, he was sentenced to 21 years in federal prison for being a convicted felon in possession of a hunting rifle. He is a kid of many talents. Not only does he make moonshine, or white lightning as it is called here, he also runs a makeshift tattoo parlor from his cell, a Walkman repair shop, and a greeting card factory. Every penny he earns goes into his veins. Red wants me to help him distill his wine, a job I really don't want to be involved in. Things don't look safe in his cell. Look, I'm going to wrap these wires here to the wires in the light socket, he tells me. If the electricity hits me, you gotta grab me. Hit me, just get me off the wires. The look on my face does something to him because he starts to laugh hysterically at me. For some reason, I do the same. Fuck no, I ain't doing that, I say in disbelief. Incredulous that he would ask me to do such a thing. Aw, oh, man, you're one of those uppity honkies from New York. Think you can't make your own whiskey. Nah, I just ain't messing with no electric, and if your ass gets electrocuted, they ain't blaming me for killing your ass, I reply. So you're going to let me get electrocuted, bro? Red ass, as he begins twisting the wires together with no regard to my objections. He starts laughing again. If you ain't finna get me off this electric, and I die, I get an early release, he continues. Come on, Red, I ain't with this shit, man, I say making my way to the door. Red starts shaking. I feel instant panic well up inside me. I want to dart for the door. I am halted by another of Red's hysterical laughs. I'm just fucking with you, man. I do this shit all the time. Man, you should not be playing like that, Red. 
Don't trip, it's all good. Just wanted to see if you were willing to try and save my life. I see you're not, he says with a giggle. Come on, I ain't messing with no electric, kid. I can see that. With friends like you, who needs enemies? We both laugh at that. What kind of friend wants his friend to get electrocuted with him, I say? One that is afraid to die alone. Man, I'd rather die like that than let one of those scumbags stab me, Red replies with a laugh. Man, I don't want to get zapped or stabbed or killed, for real, Red. Neither do I. Everything's cool. We have to cook this liquor. You going to help me or what? The cops don't care, bro. I nod my head that I'm going to help him. Red's homemade heating element is a disassembled iron. All the plastic has been removed. The only thing left is the steel and electric cord. The cord is attached to the wires protruding from the wall. Red drops the disassembled iron into the liquid that has been brewing for days. Before long, the liquid begins to boil. A hose is attached to a plastic bag sitting in another bucket, this one filled with ice, to catch the alcohol. The cell looks like a set from Mr. Wizard's World episode. The alcohol boils off at a lower temperature than the water content allowing the condensation to filter through the hose and into the bag, Red explains. I listen intently. The process separates the alcohol from the liquid content, creating good old prison moonshine. The cell is hotter than a summer day in an Arizona desert. Sweat drips from my brow. Ozzy Osbourne's War Pigs blares from Red's homemade speaker. Red's cell reminds me of Booper's Uncle Bobby's party room. The party room had old rock and roll posters on the wall, an old table with cigarette scorches burnt into the wood, some chairs, and an old boom box with dried up paint all over it. The party room is where Bobby, his friends, and prostitutes would smoke cocaine base. Occasionally, they would shoot up cocaine or heroin in the party room. It was hot, filthy, and filled with lawlessness just like Red Cell. Again, I am wondering how I got myself into this bullshit. I'm hanging out with Red, making a potion that will surely contribute to some form of violence. Hanging out with Red is simply a way to pass the time in a place filled with boredom. What's up with the ice, I ask? That stops the bag from blowing up. If the wires come off that iron, it could turn the bucket into a fireball. That's when you better run for real, Red says, laughing again. After two hours of talking and sweating like crazy, the process is finished. Both of us are still alive. Red takes a small plastic cup and dips it into the moonshine-filled bag. He takes a spoon and puts it on his locker. A little bit of alcohol is put on the spoon, and he lights it on fire. Blue flames dance a tango before our eyes for a minute or two. Red motions me for a high five. Do you know what that means, Chad? Nah, I respond. It means that shit is gas. These motherfuckers are going to pay top dollar for my liquor, Red says, excitement in his voice. Alcohol quality is tested by lighting it on fire. The bluer the flame, the longer the dance, the better the quality. I can only imagine what this stuff will do to a person's insides, but that seems to be the least of people's worries around here. Nobody seems too concerned about their insides. Red's liquor sells like hotcakes. The prices vary. For half a pint, he pulls in four books of stamps or $20. A whole pint sells for seven books of stamps or $35. If you're thirsty but broke, you can get a small cup for a book and a half. Red caters to everyone. Within an hour, Red pulls in 300 jail dollars. Not bad for three days of watching a bag of liquid turn into alcohol, then processing it for a few hours in extreme heat. Red shoots four books of stamps in the air toward me. I catch three and fumble the last one. It falls to the ground. That's for helping me. Four for helping you, and I need four more for the heat, and four your jokes on that wire, I reply. I was going to only give you two for being so damn scared, Red says walking out of the door, leaving me in his cell. I know where he is going without him saying. His newly earned stamps will be going to the Serenios. Right now, they own the prison heroin market here at Big Sandy. Many men here are victims of the same addiction. They cannot get out of the infamous cycle of shooting heroin. Black tar heroin through a homemade needle is an escape from prison. It quells the pain of loneliness for a short time. Drug abuse was the road that led legions of these men through Big Sandy's doors. The addiction is its own journey with no end in sight for the addicted. Like Noki, the prospect of death does not quench the thirst. With the extreme violence on this end, I will never be able to comprehend why any of these prisoners would ever allow their judgment to be clouded with drugs. It is easy for me to recognize that I always have to be aware of my surroundings, who's who, what people are doing, and saying. Life could be over in the blink of an eye if I'm caught off guard. Plenty of people will be off guard today, thanks to Red's moonshine. Others will be nodding off into a heroin daze. Danger for everyone, more for those intoxicated. Danger is looming in the distance. Red is back with a Kool-Aid smile. He knows that the venom he puts in his arm will take him out of here before long, 
into his temporary special place. While he cannot escape the razor wire physically, Black Tar allows him to do so in his mind. You don't want to watch me do this shit, do you, Red Ass? I don't give a fuck. I am interested in knowing how he is going to intravenously contaminate his body. As expected, Red has a homemade device that looks like the needle Jamie Foxx used in the Ray Charles movie. Even prison cannot stop people from dancing with the opiate devil. Red's prison-style syringe is easy to make. It's cobbled from needles stolen from the medical department, smuggled in from cops, visitors, or through the mail. Points for the needle sell for two books of stamps. Once a prisoner has a point, they cut an ink pen in half using dental floss as a saw. The tip of the pen is melted around the needle. Once that's done, a bladder is needed. That is usually made from a milk bag's nipple attached to the other end of the pen. All of this is held together by a rubber band. Prisoners are innovative people. They have to be. My eyes are focused on red. The whole situation has me in curiosity's grip. Come on, man, you gotta stare at me, bro? Red ass. I just want to see how this shit works, Red. You're going to fuck up my high, man. Shut the fuck up. Just do what you got to do. With that, Red squeezes the bladder, lighting his veins on fire with pleasure. In a short time, he will no longer be here. His escape is imminent, but he'll be back. He pulls the binky out of his arm and licks the blood spot, bopping his head ironically to Leonard Skinner's song, Needle in a Spoon. I watch his eyes grow heavy as the music plays. His lips curl up into a tired smile. His head nods downwards. After a few seconds, he tries to lift his head. His eyes, too. But the scenario repeats itself over and over. Red has no control over himself. The poison dances in his veins. I have seen this dance before. Again, something about this dark place takes me to a sad place from my past. Looking at Red, I see 1993. My father. I have to find him. No one else knows where he is, but I do. When he cannot be found, I know he's in the party room. I rush out to find him. He is here. I find him, although I secretly hoped he would not be here, but he is sitting in a chair. Dad, what the fuck are you doing? You're already high, you scumbag? Your son's funeral is an hour away. No one can find you, I say through clenched teeth. Come on, Chad, help me. Your son just killed himself, and this is what you're doing, bitch? Huh, bitch? I yell in anger. The pain of my brother's suicide, combined with my anger at my dad's irrational decisions to be a dad and not a father, caused me to draw my hand back as I shriek. Fuck you, punk. And I do it. I slap him across his face. Never would I ever have thought I would have the courage to slap the man who brought me into this world. Today, though, is the first day that I accept he is nothing more to me than a dope junkie. For all he has put my mother through, the disrespect, the beatings, I think about beating him to death in this party room. I'm 14. Instead, I spit on him as I leave. Behind me, I hear him say in a low voice, Fuck you back, motherfucker. He laughs. I no longer have any feelings for him. Nothing can fix his absence from my brother's funeral or my life. I run home wearing tears of anger, determined to tell my family I could not find my dad. I shake my head as I come out of my daydream. Red getting high took me out of Big Sandy, too. I escape to another dark place. Left this one. For that one. My eyes focus again. One single teardrop slowly rides down my cheek. I wipe it away swiftly. I focus on Red. Standing up, I say, you know what, Red? You're a fucking loser. I'm out of here, kid. Walking out of the door of this sauna, I turn back at Red's voice. Chad, what's up, loser? I respond. Fuck you back, motherfucker, he says in a slow voice. Then he is laughing uncontrollably. Chapter 17. Rumors are floating. Something bad is going to happen. Sometimes before a car hits someone, other shot callers get the information. In these situations, they instruct the men in their car to get their affairs in order. Take showers, cancel visits, make sure they have food for the impending lockdown. The word is that the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas is going to hit a guy from Texas that is supposedly a snitch. Dinky has chosen the two missiles. One is an Aryan Brotherhood soldier, Billy Bob, the other is a man named Dwayne from Pennsylvania. Dwayne is not a gang member. When he came to Big Sandy, rumors that he might have checked in at another prison came with him. This is something he vehemently denies. Dwayne linked up with Dinky and his crew somehow. He was given an ultimatum, join Billy Bob on this mission and clean his name, or face the wrath of the men he chose to bond with. He has chosen to unleash unprovoked violence on another man to save his own skin. Cleaning up one's name is something that bewilders me. 
If a man walks through the doors of Big Sandy after violating the prison rules at another penitentiary, but can clean up his name and in doing so prevent an assault against himself, this contradicts everything I have been told since I've been here. In reality, Dwayne is nothing more than a sacrificial lamb that Dinky can cast into oceans of danger to save one of his own gang brothers from the trouble that may come with the planned assault. Both men have their orders. Armed with prison shanks, shortly after breakfast, they head to C1 housing unit. Unbeknownst to the intended victim, the two perpetrators of the intended assault slip into C1. Another Aryan Brotherhood of Texas gang member points out the prey as he strolls down the catwalk, his long hair flapping with each step. Dwayne meets the victim head on. Billy Bob comes up behind him, slashing downward. The tip of his homemade knife punctures his mark's back. As soon as he is hit, the mark dashes towards the officer station. To his dismay, the officer is not there. The officer is inaccessible. He's in the unit team area using the bathroom. The mark turns, his back to the office doors. His hands are up now. He positions himself in a boxer's stance. Billy Bob swings the knife at his target. Red blossoms on the man's white t-shirt. A circle of blood forms on his shoulder, illustrating where he was hit. The target begins to swing wildly. He screams for help. Dwayne swings an empty fist and connects with his prey's head. The man runs. Both Dwayne and Billy Bob give chase. Up the stairs to the second floor. Back down. Back up. The officer has arrived, alerted by the screams. He too seems to panic. He hits the deuces on his handheld radio. Dwayne wraps his arms around the patsy and Billy Bob closes in. He begins to butcher the victim, stabbing him repeatedly. The screams echo throughout the housing unit. Some prisoners head to their cells. Others look on as if this is just another day at the office. Staff has finally arrived to help the fallen. Billy Bob is tackled to the ground. Dwayne's arms are peeled off the wounded man. Both are handcuffed. Prisoners are ordered to their cells. Medical staff arrive with a stretcher to take the long-haired man to the hospital. The prison is locked down only long enough to clean up the blood. Normal operations resume in no time. Within 10 days, Billy Bob and Dwayne are back on the compound. The sanctions for the beastly assault are a mere 10 days in the shoe, a 90-day loss of commissary, and the customary 27 days loss of good conduct time. Not a big deal in this place. Sanctions like this are no more than a joke. There is no deterrent effect for those who entertain the thought of stabbing someone. The consequences for such actions are nil. A common saying behind these gray walls is you have a license to carry a knife or stab someone as long as you don't kill them. Most people are never charged with a new crime unless they kill someone or assault a staff member. We are the outcasts whose lives mean nothing to society. In prison lingo, it's all legal around here. Nothing is done to quell the problems here that rack me with fear and anxiety. For Dwayne, Dinky's word was as good as the person he gave it to. No good. There is a plan in place to hit Dwayne now. I was wrong. They are not going to let him clear his name. The same rumors that I heard about Dwayne must have reached his ears as well. He detoured to the lieutenant's office on his way to lunch. He asked for protection. Had he stayed, there were men drooling to please Dinky by assaulting him. The PC move stays with you no matter where you go. Once a prisoner checks in, he is doomed. Cleaning one's name is a myth. With Dwayne gone, Dinky and his crew of misfits locked their eyes on a man in his 50s named Fleetwood. He was an original member of the Texas Aryan Brotherhood gang. The Texas Aryan Brotherhood began as a state prison gang in Texas. This is the way Dinky was introduced to the gang. Many of those gang members later ended up in the federal system where they branched off and formed a new gang, which they named Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. Fleetwood thought he was in a pool of comrades. Instead, he was in a puddle filled with sharks. Little does he know, in just a few short hours, he will become shark bait. This time, Dinky dispatches three Aryan Brotherhood of Texas members to draw blood. In the early morning hours, the recreation yard becomes a gladiator pit once again. Staff are oblivious to the three young men in their 20s, beating a man who could be their father. Fleetwood is beaten with padlocks attached to belts. He is sitting in the grass, shoes off, his toes curled up towards the bright sun. A slight breeze caresses the blue grass. The first padlock blow comes from the side. It splits Fleetwood's cheek open, blood like a rushing stream. Somehow he gets to his knees, but that lasts for no more than two seconds. The other two young men swing their weapons. Fleetwood topples over face first into the dirt. Now comes the hard black boots to Fleetwood's face, ribs, and back. I witness this assault from a distance, anger welling up inside me. For a moment, I feel my own desire for violence tease me from within. I forget that the old man is a gang member momentarily. I long for an opportunity to destroy these three filth-filled men. I envision a baseball bat in my hands, swinging it like Mark McGuire. 
Rather than connecting with a fast pitch, it's their heads. How anyone can beat up an old man the way they are leaves me both irate and perplexed. But this is prison. They are gang members. This is not my business, so I must suppress my anger along with my craving to intervene. The assaulters finally tire. They leave Fleetwood laying in the grass, a bloody mess. When the move is called, the aggressors leave the yard making their way back to their housing units. Fleetwood is still laying in the grass like a dead deer when they close the recreation yard. One officer is tasked with doing a check of the yard to make sure all prisoners are back inside. The officer sees Fleetwood laying on the grass. He calls out, Hey you, recall. Time to go inside. No response. It's time to go, I said. The officer calls out again. He is close enough now to see the blood on Fleetwood's face. Oh, what the fuck, he yells out. He's rubbing his forehead as he raises the radio to his mouth with his other hand, wondering how he missed the assault. He mouths something into the radio. Staff come running out of the doors from all directions. They just stare at Fleetwood when they reach him. They don't know if he is alive or dead. No one checks for a pulse. Medical staff arrive. They move Fleetwood to the all-familiar stretcher. Somehow, he moans in pain. His face continues to swell from the trauma. I look on in anger, desperate to be released from this land of horrors. Lock these motherfuckers down, the captain says. I'm tired of this bullshit every day. Who the fuck is in that tower? The captain yells. The rest of us are finally ordered off the yard. When the door to the cell locks behind me, it does not bother me. I feel relieved, knowing that we are going to be locked down. Finally, a break from the violence. With the doors locked, I can rest knowing I am safe, at least for a few days. Chapter 18 We got the 2200, Booper. See if Bouncy will sell us a 62, I say to Booper. Man, he wants 2400. Just tell him we got the 2200. We've been doing business with him, kid. Man, I ain't doing it. That's the shit I'm talking about, Booper. Your fat ass don't want to do nothing. I'll do it, I say, walking out the door. My breath dances in the cold air as my feet crunch on the hard snow beneath me. The streets are deserted in the frosty night. Street lights have long been shot out. The city has failed to fix them. This is the land of the undesirables. Crackheads, prostitutes, heroin junkies, alcoholics, hustlers, pimps, and nobodies. Who the fuck wants to fix these people's lights? No one. They call this neighborhood Ghost Town, after all. If they fix the lights, they might have to change the name. Hey, baby, you trying to do something? A prostitute appears from nowhere and calls out to me. Nah, I'm good. Chad, is that you, the voice asks. I look to the side of the house where the voice came from. The voice belongs to Booper's mother. Yeah, it's me. And you need to get your ass off these streets, Doreen, I say to her. Shit, I'm trying to make some money, Doreen responds. I keep walking toward Bouncy's house, my hand in my pocket, making sure my money is safe. If I were to lose that, my drug dealing days would be through. Getting a gun is my first priority. The steps creak under my weight as I make my way to the door. My knuckles rap on the hard wood. I stand there. No answer. I rap on the door again, louder this time. This time a voice hollers out. Who the fuck is it? It's C, I respond. Who? C, man. Booper's homeboy. The door opens a crack. Bouncy looks into my face. Where is Booper? His fat ass ain't want to get off the couch, so I came. Come in, he says, opening the door for me. It's dark, but I see a shotgun by the door and a pistol in Bouncy's hand. I follow him to the kitchen. The door to the oven is open. Flames dance on the stove. The smell of grease flirts with my senses as the warmth hits my hands. What you need? Man, I'm trying to get a deuce, I say excited. Oh, you little young white motherfuckers done came up. Shopping for deuces now? A little something, I respond. Man, I'm charging 24, but that shit is good. Fiends love it. I got 22. Can't do it for that. That's all we got. That ain't all you got. Even young white motherfuckers trying to get over on the black man. I laugh at this. Come on, man. This time, let me win. Next time, I'll pay the 24, I say trying to compromise. You see, see, you're a hustler. That fat motherfucker you call your partner, he's a fat, lazy piece of shit. I respect your hustle, so I'm going to do it. Next time, it's 24. When I come for the big eight, though, I need it for four, I respond. Big eight? You're moving fast. Take the deuce and do what you do. I count the money out. Bouncy hands me the deuce. Walking through the snow, I think to myself that this partnership thing with Booper might not work out much longer. Like an omen to confirm my thoughts, I see his mother again in the driveway. She's on her knees, someone's hands in her hair. The guy's back rests on an old rusty Buick. She found someone that was trying to do something. Now she can get high. I secure my 62 in my hand, 
I squeeze tight. Two ounces, six grams of cocaine. At the age of 15, I have already become a product of my environment. Here I come, Big Sandy. Here I fucking come. Chapter 19 After the lockdown, the violence never ceases to exist. The thirst to unleash anger on others pulsates through the prison. Staff have allowed a former police chief from Louisiana to walk the compound. That's the talk on the line, at least. It is alleged that he found himself on the other side of the law for violating the civil rights of the people he arrested. Part of the intake process is an interview with the prison's captain. The captain decides if a prisoner is safe to walk the compound. Safe? No one is safe to walk the line on this compound. Not me, not other prisoners, not staff. This guy is literally a lone zebra among lions. Two men from the Aryan Resistance Militia, arm, volunteer to make the hit on the ex-cop. One of the men is Donnie. Ironically, Donnie is from Massachusetts. He's not in our car because he's an armed gang member. He has nearly 17 years in on a 25-year sentence. He emits anger, a roughness that cannot be faked. Like Red, Donnie also has a heroin habit that he fuels with proceeds from his moonshining business. He looks like an old Viking, short, stocky, long grain goatee. Although a little older looking, Donnie is tough as nails. He could have been a commanding officer in any of the several branches of our military. Instead, he is a loyal soldier to a prison gang. When the beating was over, the ex-cop was still alive. Barely. He had to be mercy flighted to a hospital after this flagitious whipping where he was kicked in the head numerous times with a hard plastic tip boot. Within 30 days, Donnie is out of the shoe. Pat's on the back for a job well done. The saga at Big Sandy swirls like an out-of-control tornado. Gazing out the window, my eyes look past the razor wire to the hills where trees dance slowly in the warm wind. Daydreaming of home, my family, my mother, the people I care for. Tease. No one can know how I really feel unless they've been in this prison. Trapped in a dangerous place, wishing I could take back some of the decisions I made. I wonder how many other men look out the windows craving a second chance at life. Silently telling God that if he would only grant their request, they would never reoffend. Big Sandy has a way of making even hardened men appreciate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The old saying, crime doesn't pay, rings true. My most treasured fantasy is being on the other side, climbing the trees that sway in the wind. Running through the tinted blue grass to a hiding place is a fantasy imprinted on my subconscious, amplified by repetition. A knock at my cell door jolts me from my run in the grass. From the grass back to my cell, I lift my head and nod. Lefty walks in. What are you looking at out there, Lefty ass? He walks to the window to take a look himself. The trees, man. The trees, I sigh. Man, with your time, fuck the trees. It's just going to fuck you up looking out there. You have to accept this as your life for now, Chad. I know, but I like looking out there. Do what you want, but my advice is, fuck the trees, fuck the grass, fuck the world, Lefty says. He laughs. You didn't come in here to tell me about the trees, right? What's up? Oh, shit. No, um, there are some new guys just come in. One is from Boston. I'm sure he's going to be in your car, so you might want to come meet him. I follow Lefty, and we approach the new guy. Lefty begins the introduction. This is Chad, the guy I told you about from New York. The new guy extends his hand to shake mine. Frank, I'm from the Cape. How much time you got, I ask? Twelve years for heroin and a gun. Frank is jittery. I can tell he is nervous. Like myself, he rode that long, lonely bus from Atlanta. He listened to the same Big Sandy stories I heard. Come on, man. We'll go to my cell to talk away from these dudes, I say. As soon as we are out of earshot of the other prisoners, Frank begins to pelt me with questions. The fear in his eyes is immediate. The anguish in his voice is noticeable. Look, man, I say to him, you're going to be all right. I know you're nervous. Man, why would they send me to a place like this? I'm only 24 years old with 12 years, kid. Frank's eyes start to water as he tells me this. Because the people in charge are scumbags. They don't care about shit. People are getting killed here, Frank says. It's not as bad as the stories you heard. I lie to Frank, hoping to calm him down. My intentions are simply to help ease Frank's fears until he can adjust to his new circumstances. If he can make it through the first few days, he will be okay. I know the same feeling he is experiencing. Dude, I don't want to die in here. These people running this place don't give a fuck about no one, kid. Frank says this with urgency in his voice. Look, you too nervous. Are you hot? It's freezing cold in here. I ain't hot. Nah, man. Hot. Like, did you snitch on someone in your case? They call that hot in here. Fuck no, I'm a petty-ass drug dealer that they sent to this slaughterhouse. 
okay, I'm going to give you some advice that I should not give you. If you're hot, you need to get the fuck out of here because they will hurt you. If not, you're good here. I say this to Frank with firmness in my voice so he gets the point. Chad, look at me. I'm not hot or whatever you call it, but I am scared. Here's a little secret for you. I was too a few months ago when I first got here. I am still here and I ain't been killed. You're going to make it. Just try to calm down. For some reason, I am determined to help Frank make it. I don't want him to take that long walk out of fear. That could ruin his career. He is nervous, fearful. Scared people sometimes take the walk to protective custody for no real reason other than their misplaced fear. People don't understand that making that choice only makes their stay in prison harder. The call for Chow echoes throughout the unit. When I reach Frank's cell, he's laying in his bunk staring at the ceiling. He tells me that he does not want to go to Chow. He has to be hungry after the trip. My urging him to join me does little. He protests, telling me that he's tired and not hungry. His fear of being here, of meeting more felons, prevents him from eating. Steve sees me as I enter the chow hall and waves me toward him. Hey, you got a new guy from Boston over there, he asks. I can tell he is wondering why the new guy is not with me. Yeah, his name is Frank. He's from the Cape. Oh, yeah? Where is he? Steve asks with a smile. He didn't come to chow. Said he wasn't hungry. Wanted to shower and relax. I can tell Steve is pissed off, although he pretends that he isn't. He thinks everyone should worship him. Those who don't should be brutalized. At least that is what I think Steve thinks. I dislike Steve more and more with every passing day. Steve tells me to tell Frank to make sure he is at breakfast to meet all of the homeboys. I agree. I wonder if Frank will still be there when I get back to deliver the message from the puppeteer. If you are from New York or Massachusetts, there really is no choice when it comes to the car. You're either riding or you're getting a plane ticket out of here purchased with force. The car won't necessarily stab you, but Steve will send three or four guys to kick the daylights out of you. Like most things behind these walls, it's better to take the best of the bad options. Joining the car willingly is much easier. To Steve, refusing the car is rejecting your homeboys, your brothers. This is a major disrespect. If you have no loyalty to the people from your state, your brothers, then you do not belong here, according to Steve, Adam, and Dennis. The job of telling Frank this reality has fallen into my lap. This assignment might not be necessary if Frank disappears before I get back. It's hard for me to fathom being loyal to a group of people that you do not know. I am sure Frank will feel the same. In a place like this, though, you have to align yourself with someone. No one wants to be alone in this dog-eat-dog world. Being alone in here is not the wisest choice. Since I've been here, no one has declined Steve's smiling offer to join the homeboy's pack of loyalty. The only problem is, one day you are a brother, the next you could easily become a victim. Frank is still there when I peer through his cell window, still laying on his bunk and still staring at his ceiling. I knock, causing Frank to look up at me. I walk in. I don't wait for him to wave me in. What's up, I say. Nothing, just relaxing, Frank replies. Look, man, the homeboys were mad because you didn't show up to chow. They want to meet you. Man, I just want to relax. I don't want to meet these people. I laugh at this statement, knowing this is not an option. I explain to Frank what a car is, how things work in here. When I tell him about Steve, he tells me he thinks Steve is an asshole and a control freak. Again, I look out for Frank telling him to keep those thoughts to himself, because if Steve gets wind of talk like that, he will send some people to hurt him. Frank's eyes light up again. See, this is the shit I was talking about, Chad. These dudes want to kill people for some bullshit. Well, it could happen, but you have to think before you say or do things around here. Protect yourself by making the right choices in here, Frank. This Steve guy? Man, who does he think he is? Whitey Balger from Southie or some shit? Can I just do my own time? Stay to myself? You want the truth, I reply? Yeah, actually I do, Chad. Well, the truth is, you can't do your own thing. Trust me, you don't want to be alone in here, even if they let you, which they won't. They would have four or five guys kick the shit out of you. After that, you'll be in the hole for four or five months. Then you will be on another plane going to another USP, where there will be more Boston and New York guys waiting to tell you that you have no choice. Either you get in the car, or they kick the shit out of you. So, in the end, you can save yourself a whole lot of misery and ass whippings. So I got no choice is what you're telling me. Listen, Frank, this place is like living under a communist government. Steve is at the top of the pecking order. You cannot talk bad about Steve, Adam, Dennis, Ronnie, or the car. Your best bet is to go along with the get-along. Stay out of the way, follow the rules, and pray to God your points go down so you can go to a medium security prison. Frank is getting the message. He nods his head, agreeing with my words. Do you think I'm going to make it here, Chad? 
as long as you didn't tell anyone you will. I got 12 years. I ain't supposed to be in a USP. I have no idea why they sent me here. My response is simple. There are a lot of dirty people out there, Frank. No one cares about where they send you. If you live or die, no one gives a shit. Why? Because they go home every night to their family. If a bed is open in Big Sandy when your number comes up, that's where you're going, kid. This system sucks, and we are swept up in it. It's near to lock-in time. I shake hands with Frank and prompt him to try and get some sleep. I tell him to make sure he is up for breakfast in the morning, fulfilling my obligation to Steve. Tonight will not be an easy night for Frank, but I think he will make it. As I lay in my bunk, I find that my night too is difficult. Mental exhaustion has set in from dealing with Frank. Usually when the lock is in place for the evening, the stress subsides. You can relax to a certain extent then. And here with Mr. Young as my cellmate, I know I am safe. One more day down on my 40-year sentence. Big Sandy has a way of draining its inhabitants, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Only God can hear my cries. My heart aches for just one more chance at life. Just one more chance at freedom. Every rising sun comes with the perplexity of wondering if I can make it through another day. With so little hope of ever being out there again, ever finding true happiness, I fiddle briefly with thoughts of suicide. This is my never-ending nightmare. There is no escape. When the sun rises, my daily hurdles transcend limits that seem as though they are impossible to overcome. 